Good evening, everyone. My name is David Miller, and I want to welcome you to this month's Rhinebeck Historical Society talk. I'm going to talk about the history of cigar manufacturing in Rhinebeck. But before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my personal history with cigars. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I went through a multi-year phase of cigar smoking. I sort of felt that uh, it made me look a little more sophisticated and adult, and it was really enjoyable to have a cigar at the dinner instead of some chocolate cake. And uh, I like the names of them, was, was Tiamo Meditation and Tiamo Relaxation. So it threw a nice, a nice to puff on them. So every year I would save up uh, my vacation and spend a, year, a month in Europe every summer. And uh, one summer, we could go to the next slide, uh, I stopped at Orly Airport on my way into France, and I went to the gift shop and I bought a couple of dozen Romeo and Juliet the Havana cigars. And every night during my trip, I puffed on the Havana cigars, much stronger than the Tiamo cigars, but they were pretty good. And when I got back to Orly, I toured with the idea of buying a couple of boxes and sticking them in my suitcase but I had visions of being arrested by customs and sent to federal prison for smuggling contraband into the country. So I chickened out. And I that. Um, now, buying them by box, of course, presented a, a problem that uh, I had to keep them uh, humidified. So I bought, if we can go to the next slide, I walked up and down Atlantic Avenue and found this oh little mahogany cigar humidor, which I still have today. It's, this is in my house in Rhinebeck. And if you open the door, you can see it's copper lined, and you put the cigars in there, and the little pins on the door held a sponge, and wet a sponge, and close it in there, and it kept them absolutely perfectly. Mm. Another wonderful thing I found on Atlantic Avenue was this. It's a, I guess it's a, called a pipe dream, I guess you would call it. I'll pass it around the audience. It, uh, it's a, a pipe, and coming out of it is a puff of a beautiful woman, and it's done with uh, cigar wrappers. I remember my grandfather used to smoke cigars and he would give me the little wrappers that I'd put on my finger like a ring. Yeah. In the 1980s, oh my goodness. You know, when the big hair was in, <laughs> you know, a black beard was in, um, yeah, right, I worked right. in a computer center for 40 years and every year we would, we would take all the holes that we stripped off the continuous forms and we would oh, stop and make a snowman great. and one of my staff was an artist, and he drew a picture of me and put a cigar in it, and I was the snowman for that Christmas. And that, that's my five-year-old daughter there, who's now 30 years old, in the corner. She came to all of our Christmas parties. So you can imagine my excitement when I asked Nancy Kelly, give me some ideas for more research topics. And she said, 150 years ago, there was a major cigar manufacturing business going on in Rhinebeck. We know very little about it. So why don't you research it? So I did. <clears throat> and uh, the first thing I found out was that tobacco was unknown in the Western world until Columbus came to America and brought tobacco back to uh, Europe and then took cigars and stuff took off uh, in Europe. And tobacco growing was from, from Virginia to Florida and uh, all the way to Cuba as well. But cigars were the early craze. Tobac tobacco for cigarettes didn't come into play until the 20th century. So I found some of these slides. Of course, Mark Twain in the mid-1800s was famous for smoking his cigars. And if we look at the next slide, here's <clears throat> President Grant, or General Grant at the time. I'm not sure he has a cigar in his hand, but I have uh, I found another slide, a caricature of him <laughs> smoking a cigar. And then I found a, uh, a really strange thing on eBay. This claimed to be General Glantz personal cigar humidor. We kept his four cigars in his pocket. That's what they claimed on eBay, and they were selling this thing. So uh, that sort of covers the 1850s. <laughs> now, I, uh, I searched around the archives and found some names associated with the cigar business in Rhinebeck, sometimes called Cigar, S E G A R. Conrad Marquardt, George W. Hogan, and William Monshine. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the next slide, this is a map from 1858 of Rhinebeck. It lists all the businesses along Market Street <clears throat> and Montgomery Street, and lists all of the businesses, druggists, physicians, lawyers, carpenters, and builders. There were a lot of uh, leather stores, uh, saddle stores, 
uh, stables, of course horses were very big at the time, but I zoomed it on this list of manufacturers in the next slide, and it lists a couple of those names. Here's C. Marquardt Bakery, okay? Now, he owned something, it was a bake shop and a cigar store. He manufactured cigars and made bread in the same store. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it sounds strange, but it did. Here's G.W. Hogan Cigar, S-E-G-A-R factory on Montgomery Street. So, I'm not sure how many of you, I think I've said this several times, people have read about Fulton history. But if we look at the next slide, we have scanned 150 years of the Gazettes, and this is how I researched this article, by finding articles and ads in the paper for cigar stores. Tom Treninsky in Fulton, New York, has scanned all of our Gazettes back to the 1850s, and they're searchable on the web. And it's a wonderful website, FultonHistory.com. And all I did was go to the next slide. Is, uh, it has this kind of pinball machine on the right here, but <laughs> you typed in Conrad Marquardt Rhinebeck. And up comes a whole bunch of pages about that. Yeah. It's hard to read, but um, you can zoom in on this. You can, you can cut pieces of it out, the article you're looking for, make it larger, convert it to Word, and save it, and work with it. And that's what I did. All these ads and stuff that you're going to see were snipped out of the newspaper. So the first thing I found was uh, an article about Conrad Marquardt, April 25th, uh, 1891. There's but one man in this town that can say he's been in business for 50 years consecutively, and that man is Conrad Marquardt. First day of May to be the day in which he celebrates his semi-centennial anniversary, having opened his business here in May of 1841. He's now nearly 74 years old, lacking only a few weeks. He was married the next month, in June of 1841, and so this time in 1891, He's celebrating his 50th year in business and his 50th wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. Conrad Marquardt and his store, which I'll show you in a minute, was in where Market Street Restaurant, the Panda resta uh, Restaurant was. That was the Marquardt Bakery and Cigar Store. Mm -hmm. And there's a little, a little lengthy one, if you go to the next slide. It's an article from the newspaper about um, the wedding and the, the gifts that they got. And you can read it. <laughs> Some of the highlights, it says, uh, uh, the anniversary of the happy day 50 years ago. The house was handsomely decorated with beautiful flowers uh, given by Mrs. Hunt of Barrytown. The presents were numerous and costly. The groom of 50 years presented the bride with a, a gold wedding ring. The gift to the children was a gold pin, a solitaire diamond, um, an oxidized silver pie knife. Mr. and Mrs. Holt, the silver tree said, P. Lorelei and Company, tobacco company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Napkin ring, Mr. Miss, Mrs. M. Pulse, Mrs. Brooks, a silver gray ladle, William Slay, Mr. and Mrs. Briggs, another old Rhinebeck name. Uh, we wish to add our congratulations to the many already tendered and thank Mr. and Mrs. Marquardt for a bountiful supply of wedding cake. <laughs> Something which clearly the reporter enjoyed. <laughs> so um, that's a description of the party. Now, um, his son, Douglas Marquardt, uh, this is an ad from uh, 1925. His son Douglas also worked at the cigar store, and there was some incident where um, in March of 1864, Conrad was away, and Douglas joined the 20th Regiment of the New York State Militia from Dutchess County, went down and fought in Pennsylvania in the last year of the war, which is a big thing we're celebrating this year, the 150th anniversary of uh, the middle of the Civil War. When he returned to Ryan Beck, he worked as a traveling salesman selling cigars for his father. He was also a volunteer fireman, a member of the Pocahontas Engine Company, and he opened a restaurant on Market Street under Temperance Hall, which I believe is the Village Pizza. Temperance Hall was above the Village Pizza. Um, four doors down from the corner, oysters. That was a big thing uh, in the mid-1800s in New York, oysters. Um, so if you look at the map on the next slide, this is a map uh, showing, 1867, showing C. Marquardt Bakery. Here's the Rhinebeck Hotel, the Beekman Arms, the Star Institute, and the other stores around. And here is C. Marquardt Bakery in the uh, Panda Market Street restaurant building. And if you look at the next slide, this is the 1850 census. It lists Conrad Marquardt, age 34, a baker, Maria L. Marquardt, that's his wife. And uh, so, and it says he came from Germany, Conrad Marquardt. 
in the 1871 Gazette, an article describes how cigars were made in Rhinebeck. It says, we saw a cigar press designed to press and put a fine finish on cigars. It consists of a number of molds, M-O-U-L-D-S, in the exact size of the cigar. A fresh roll of wheat is placed in each mold and placed under a screw press, which I'll show you in a minute. But taken out, they're handsomer than any handmade cigar. The machine equipment came from Germany, probably from some of Conrad's relatives who probably made cigars in Germany, I, I can only assume. Um, now, Nancy Kelly found me this from a Tampa newspaper, which is still a uh, big business in Tampa making cigars these days. And it shows how the leaves are selected, the stems are removed from the center, then the blended leaves with some filler, binder, wrapped, and the finished cigar uh, is cut to size. And if we look at the next slide, there's a, a cigar press, and this was the press that they talked about in the newspaper. You put them in the molds, the M-O-U-L-D-S, you put it in the press, and you press them. And when they came out, you had to dry them for a while because the leaves were pretty wet. Well, historian Stephen Mann loaned me this, one of his favorite possessions. It's a cigar drying device from 1870, and it says that you know, they were put in the drawers to dry, and this is not a missing drawer, it's that the larger cigars were put on top, and they needed more room. And I think we leave these slide out, and then the big lid on the top can open, and the whole thing can come yeah. apart. So um, this is what you know, we have, the little drawers that dry the cigar. So I thank Stephen for loaning us this for tonight's demonstration. It's a very cute little thing from 1870. One last slide from the Tampa newspaper. There was no radio or CNN, and I guess it was pretty boring rolling <laughs> cigars. So this photo was taken in 1909 by Lewis Hine during an investigation of child labor, and they had someone sitting up there reading the newspaper, reading stories to people who were doing this boring activity of rolling cigars. And obviously, children had little fingers, and it was, must have been very easy for them to roll cigars, and that's why they investigated child labor. And I did find something along the way that the cigar factory in Red Hook did have a, a reader. One of the articles I passed by, somebody read to them uh, when they were making cigars there. The next person that I came along was G.W. Hogan. And uh, he had a cigar store in 3 East Market Street. It says, in a minute, you'll see smokers are often at a list to find good cigars, but they need not trouble themselves more on this subject just by dropping into George W. Hogan's cigar store or anything else in line be obtained. The other day, Georgie sent us a box of celebrated Swan brand, and we can truthfully say we've never smoked better cigars in all of our life. They were fit for the head of a nation to smoke, but don't know please accept. Thanks for the favor. So George Hogan, I think it's in the next slide. Here it is. Here's the um, ad from the Gazette that I clipped out from 1862. And it says, George Hogan, dealer of imported cigars, Manufacture a variety of cigars, second door in East Market Street. The second door in is next to the department store. It's the current shoe store. And assortment of mere sham, briar root pipes, cigar tubes, uh, French and German Manhattan clay pipes, tobacco, uh, cigar cases, tobacco pouches, walking canes. The best friends of chewing tobacco, which I'm going to talk about a little <laughs> bit later. It was a big phase of chewing tobacco as well. Um, we looked at the 1870 census. And it lists George W. Hogan, 33, cigar and tobacco maker, and Frank Hogan, a clerk. Frank was three years younger. He was a clerk in the store. And later on, he took over that cigar store. So if we look at the next slide, um, George W. Hogan has invented a glass cover for cigar boxes. It displays the cigars to a much better advantage than the old style and does not cost any more. We do not know whether Mr. Hogan intends patenting his invention or not. Now, the uh, last name I looked up was William Monchai. And he owned a cigar store on East Market Street. A cigar dealer, William Monchai, has made a reduction in prices in tobacco and cigars. He wants the people to know it. He's right. For the particulars, read his advertisement in another column. I found several spellings. Monchai, Mondoshai, Mondoshai. There were three kinds of spellings for that. And just to show you that, when you're using the Gazette on the web at Folk and History, you type in 
Monshine Cigars Rhinebeck. And everything comes up about that. Well, the next article comes up, has nothing to do with cigars, but it's a brilliant thing of something that happened in Rhinebeck 150 years ago. Here's an ad, <coughs> Rhinebeck Tribune, November 19, 1970. On Wednesday afternoon, Mr. J. Calvin Acker drove into town with his spirited team attached to a wagon loaded with potatoes and turnips. Stopping in front of an East Market Street store, he left the team in charge of a boy named Goldfoil. The horses from some cause ran down the street and collided with a buggy wagon belonging to Robert Prosper Esquire, which was speedily demolished. The next brought up against an awning posted in front of Monshine Cigar Store. There it is. Where the boy was unloaded, after which the runaways collided with Peter Traver's team and sent them down the street at a fearful gate. Both teams were finally stopped, but at the cost of much wreckage. So, this has nothing to do with cigars, but Rhinebeck, Monshine Cigars, pulls up this article. Once you start digging into this, you can still spend hours on your computer reading the ads, you know, rooms at a Poughkeepsie hotel for a dollar a night. I mean, just amazing stuff you read in the Gazette. And we owe a great favor to Mr. Treminsky for doing this uh, for us. So if you look at the next slide, William Monshine has, 1877, has a fine quality of old Kentucky chewing tobacco. Uh, Smoking tobacco, which she sells for 40 cents a pound. And fine quality of chewing tobacco can be found at William Monshine for 65 cents. It's the cheapest and best tobacco in town. Now, I've been unable to locate the exact location of the store. Again, it's on East Market Street somewhere. If you look at the next slide, here's from the March 1877 Gazette. Clothing and gents furnishing of goods at New York prices. Peter Brenner's new one-price store in William Monshine's building on East Market Street. Clearly, it was on East Market Street. Suits, $5. Coats, $3. A heavy undershirt, 37 and a half. I have no idea what that means. I don't think we were dealing with pence in 1877, but, you know. Don't forget, the new one price store in William Monshine's building, East Market Street. No number. So if anybody has any ideas of where this might have been, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I did find many interesting articles in the Gazette. Uh, and in 1875, something happened. William Monshine's brother, Samuel, had a cigar store on the Roundout in Kingston. And somehow, they bought their tobacco from the city, and they didn't pay the uh, people who sold it to them, or they lied about it. And there was a big scandal in the newspapers looking for the Monshine brothers. And I have something to read. It's a little lengthy, but it's a great story about Rhinebeck. This is from the Daily Freeman, April 19, uh, 1875. Monshine brothers in trouble again, arrested for perjury. After a complaint was made before Justice Mark Rott at Rhinebeck on the 14th of April, now, oh, wait a second. Conrad Marquardt was justice of Rhinebeck at the time and a competitor of the Monchines. This is a little conflict of interest here. Uh, of Samuel Monchine, whose operations in tobacco have been prominently mentioned of late, had committed perjury on the 8th of April. A warrant was issued and given to Constable Burr, who immediately made a search for Samuel. But the latter had made himself considerably inconspicuous of late. Constable Burr, however, had suspicions that Monshine was in Poughkeepsie at Mr. Levi's house and proceeded thither at once. In the meantime, William Monshine, brother of Samuel, got wind of the affair in some way and started out to inform his brother. He took the Rhinebeck and the Rhinebeck Connecticut Railroad, the cars north to Barrytown to throw them off, then took a southbound train down to Poughkeepsie <laughs> to allay suspicions. When Burr arrived at Poughkeepsie, he proceeded at once to Levi's house and inquired where Samuel was, but they declared he hasn't been there. Burr was not satisfied with this answer, however, he went to the Hudson River Railroad Depot, I guess that's the Poughkeepsie station, where he lay low for Monshine. <laughs> at last, he found his patience rewarded by the sight of Samuel, dressed in his best, legging it at top speed for the cars. When he arrived at the, at the depot, Burr nabbed him and took him to Rhinebeck. And the article goes on to talk about, he, they both put before Justice Marquardt, who felt that the materials had to be confiscated because held 
you know, for the New Yorkers who were suing them. So he put it in his humidor, in his warehouse, for safekeeping. I, you know, <laughs> this is amazing. You can't make that stuff up. <laughs> so, um, as I said, Fulton history has proved quite invaluable in this research. And I looked in the, to try to find out about them in the uh, census, 1860, 1870, 1880, Monshine, Mondoshine, Mondashine. They weren't here. I, I don't know. It's another mystery about the brothers. So, we can show a few more slides about cigars. Here's 1881. Now it says Frank Hogan, 3 East Market, the shoe store, that was confirmed now, the younger brother. Jacob Pottenberg, 30 East Market, opened the cigar store. M. L. Marquette, that's Maria, his wife, I guess took over for Conrad at some point, wholesale tobacconist, and Baker, strange combination, 20 West. And William Smith, cigar, tobacco, pipes, 22 East Market Street. So it kept going. A lot of more cigar stores opened. A lot of people were making cigars in Rhinebeck. If we go to the next slide, here's 1892. Are you a smoker? If, if you are, go to Pottenberg's and look at their assortment of pipes, cigar holders, cases, cigarette holders, tobacco boxes, pouches, smoking sets. A special sale of cigars by the box. Don't miss opportunity. Shirts and cigarettes. The first time I see cigarettes mentioned in some of these ads in 1892. So cigarettes at Pottenberg's, which was 30 East Market Street. Then here's uh, 1889. William Riley, 30 East Market Street. The place to buy all kinds of fresh saltwater fish, clams, oysters, and also a full line of cigars and tobacco. So he sold out, and Pottenberg moved around the corner. Um, if you look at that, because the next sign, 1918, it says uh, Pottenberg's on Montgomery Street. So he must have moved around the corner, the old reliable cigar store, uh, a long line of pipes. Pottenberg established over 40 years. And Pottenberg was also, uh, the 1880 census listed him as being a retail grocer, which explains why there was also groceries in William Riley's store. And uh, he was town clerk for many years around the turn of the century, Jacob Pottenberg. And here's just one more, Buccioni, 1920. And that was somewhere along East Market Street. There was a picture in our archives that I found of a Buccioni cigar store, but it's an empty store. And it doesn't give it a number, so I'm not really sure what number it was. They were on the north side of the street for Skemmies. Okay. And then here's a funny one. This is 1908, 3 East Market. Somebody named Miller, no relation to me, <laughs> moved into the Hogan Cigar Store. Mm -hmm. The shoe store is now. Ice cream, ice cream soda, <laughs> confectionery, toys, cigars, tobacco, oh. postcards. Edison phonograph records, J. L. Miller. That must be a trick. So over the next hundred years, they all disappeared, and all we have left today is the current cigar store with the famous wooden statue in front of it. And uh, I want to talk about the history of this intersection, but before I do, I want to talk about two things: chewing tobacco and tobacco itself. The first mail pouch chewing tobacco was sold in many of these stores. A mail pouch tobacco barn, or simply a mail pouch barn, is a barn with one or more sides painted from 1890 to 1992 with an advertisement for the West Virginia Mail Pouch Chewing Tobacco Company in Wheeling, West Virginia. <coughs> At the height of the program in the early 18, 1960s, there were 20,000 mail pouch barns in 22 states. Yeah. And this is the only one in Dutchess County. This is in Stanford <coughs> Village near Bengal. It says, chew mail pouch tobacco. I have some better pictures of these. Initially, the barn owners were paid between $1 and $2 a year for the advertisement, equivalent in 1913 dollars to about $20 to $40 today. But more importantly, they received a much desired fresh coat of paint on their barn. <laughs> the, the mail pouch painted the message on one or two sides, depending on which got best advantage from the road, and they could paint the other side any color the owner wanted. And many of the bonds were repainted every few years to maintain the sharp colors. After World War II, many of the bonds were painted by Harley Warwick of yep. Belmont County, Ohio. Yep. He once estimated he painted 20,000 barns in his lifetime, <laughs> spending an average of six hours on each one. That's fast. Yeah. That's yeah. very impressive. So if we look at the next slide, here's one over the border in Orange County, in Walden, 
And Harvey said he always started with the E in CHU to yeah. center the sign. Yeah. So the, the E is over, the P is over, yeah. the A is tobacco, and that's, how, and that's how Harvey did it. Um, he, I want you to see this sign clearly. So here's one from Ohio. I don't know if it's there. But this is what it says. CHU, male pouch tobacco, treat yourself to the best. And that's what, there were 20,000 of these barns. And then uh, in uh, 1992, the owner of Mail Pouch Tobacco, Swisher International, decided to suspend the use of barn advertisements when Warwick retired from painting it. Mm -hmm. So they ended. There's probably barns around that still have the fading mm -hmm. um, names of Mail Pouch all over them. And the, the second topic is tobacco. Now, as I said, tobacco was grown by Native Americans long before the settlers. Following the arrival of, of the Europeans, tobacco became a popular trade item among the settlers. Throughout, it fostered the economy in the southern states, but although tobacco has a reputation of being grown in the south, it was grown a lot in 17th and 18th centuries in New York City. Dutch colonists grew it in New Amsterdam. Settlers occupying farms in Greenwich Village, all the way up to Morningside Heights, grew tobacco a little closer to home. It was farmed in Dutchess County in several spots in Menia and Red Hook, but the biggest part was right across the border in the Connecticut Valley. And there's a museum there uh, in Windsor, Connecticut, called it the Connecticut Valley Tobacco Museum. And uh, there's you know, quite a lot of people work there, and a lot of tobacco was grown in there. But apparently, a lot of tobacco was purchased from uh, New York City and from the south, maybe even Cuba, because trains were running, and trains could bring tobacco from the south. They didn't necessarily have to use tobacco from Connecticut or from Red Hook in their factories. So I got a couple of pictures of tobacco barns. You can see how the tobacco was hung to dry. The air could move through the barns. I like this one. Where and, is that, David? Uh, it's in upstate New York. I, there was a, uh, I'm trying to remember, up in the Finger Lakes. A lady wrote an article from the Lindley, New York Historical Society about tobacco growing in the Finger Lakes. Mm -hmm. I guess she did a certain kind of, that grapes grow there too, mm -hmm. a certain kind of environment of moistness mm -hmm. or whatever, and they grew tobacco and grapes up there. And she had some of these photographs from upstate New York. Mm -hmm. So this is this one, and then this is another one where the air could move through this nice old barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is upstate New York. And I love the next, the last one. This is like a, a convertible barn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the slats would open up, you could use it as a barn to store other things, or you could open these slots, and every along down the side of the barn, and air would flow through it, and it worked out really nice to have air flowing through it. So I like that. And locally, tobacco was grown in Red Hook in the mid 1800s. A couple of hundred acres were uh, used to grow tobacco, and some of it was processed in the village of Red Hook at a factory built by Robert Massano. And here's a picture of the murals in Red Hook. Uh, there's people making the tobacco. This is on the side of that building uh, where Miller's books are used to be behind the parking mm -hmm. lot there. And there's another picture, which I got from Claudine, tobacco and saw manufacturer. Here's the Massino factory. And that was on the, uh, up in the little corner with a red hook on the previous slide. Still so there. It's, it's a building. The building yeah, the building's still, still there. there. Yeah. So that's tobacco. Mm -hmm. Now, I tried to trace the history of the intersection where the current cigar store is. And I have a bunch of pictures to show you. This is the first one, early 1860s. This is before the department store was built. There's tinware, stoves, paints, oils. George W. Hogan, Cigar and Tobacco Store, mm -hmm. at 3 East. So there it is. Mm -hmm. Proof that it's right here where the horse and buggy are. There's a printing office looking down there. And this is before the department store was built. And if we go to the next slide, this is the Ego Hotel. This was built right after the fire. It's brand new, where the current cigar store is. I have a better shot, and I'll show you what the store is. That's the village pump where the water used to come from. I'm working on an article on the history of water in Rhinebeck for the spring newsletter. And that was the pump that everybody got their water from originally, right in front of the Beekman Arms. And this is brand new. This just opened after the fire, which we're going to talk about. We're going to have some stuff going on this coming year. Nancy Kelly and I are working on some things to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Great Fire, which destroyed the whole south part of East Market Street. And so all these buildings now are brick. It's like the wooden houses are gone, like three little pigs, and they built the house of stone, and those houses have lasted. 
So if we look at the next slide, this is around 1870. It's the construction of the Rhinebeck Department store. Although there's a lot of guys standing around. Nobody seems to be actually laying brick. But it gives me a much better shot of the Eagle Hotel. And I zoomed in on the next slide. And there it is. Linden's Lager Beer and Billiard Hall. So that was the first store in the current location of the cigar store. It was a billiard hall. Fantastic. And the little building, the little extension building, I'm going to show you that in a minute, the back of the hotel mm -hmm. where the current liquor store is. If we go to the next one, it's around 1900 because there's little horses and buggies. And it, you can, it's hard to read this. This says the corner shoe store. Mm -hmm. So around 1900, it became a shoe store. And that says bicycles of all sizes, uh, sundries repairing and printing. They did a lot of stuff in there, but it was shoes. There's a little old. Uh, mm -hmm baby carriage. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, you can see there's a few wires there. Yep. And the next slide, there's a lot more wires. It's very fuzzy. But it says shoes and queen. It, it's hard to read. More shoes. So clearly it was still a shoe store. And there's some old Model T Fords parked uh, in, in front of that. And there's the pump, yeah. which is still there. Now, the next slide, here is the constructed department for Harry Smiley and Company. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be bicycles in the window. Again, there's a lot of guys standing around. <laughs> <coughs> I guess they knew pictures were being taken and they, they wanted to be in the pictures. Now, the next slide is this, is, this was, this is a cigar store. In the back of the cigar store, this was Rookie's original garage. Oh, Rookie's began in here. And Lou said, that's not his dad. That's somebody working in the garage. It was a Sunoco station. And uh, that's what this little building was, where the liquor store is. And if we look at the next one, this it's a copy of a copy. That, mm. Lou said, is his dad peeking out from in there. Mm. And this is United Cigars. Jeez. And they sell loft candy and ammunition. Oh, right. <laughs> in there. And the Sunoco pumps exactly. are like in Route 9. I don't know whether they're still. Gas tanks or anything underneath, pulled in underneath there for Route gas. 9. He pulled in there for gas, and he also, his brother had the thing in uh, New York for, for Oldsmobiles. And that's how yeah, Oldsmobile That's how the Oldsmobile connection. He would sell one, and then when he moved down where, he, where they are mm -hmm. now, they, you know, they made a big thing. But he was selling mm -hmm. one at a time. <laughs> one car garage. <laughs> this, is, this is from the, the Dow's collection. Mm -hmm. It's the Beekman Arms around the same time. And there is a, a cigar unit here at the front counter with all kinds of cigars. And I love this. You know, you have the old style photographs. You unhook the lens cap. You said, don't move for 60 seconds. And you put it back on. Well, some guy got a phone call. And he, like, came in in the middle of this. And he's barely in the image answering the telephone. This guy was good. He didn't move. <laughs> This is a, uh, a parade, United Cigars. Yeah. And uh, it might have been a Memorial Day. I'm not sure. It doesn't give the time essentially what it is. It's in the archives. And it, but you can see the cigar store here. And the next slide shows across the street the department store. And of course, Foster's was a gas station, the Foster's parking lot. Mm -hmm. And the gas pumps here. So everybody's watching the parade go by. The next one. Is a postcard dated 1952 will be Market Street. Yeah. There's the United Cigar Store and Drug Store, Soda and Drugs. And here's the department store. And that the angle, a nice angle parking. Yeah. Angle parking, yes, we mm. we had angle parking. Some of us remember that. And there's been, there were discussions <laughs> about putting angle parking uh, back on East Market Street, across the, across the street from the Beekman Arms, but just. Uh, but that didn't happen. <laughs> they were just talking about that. You know what? It's interesting. Yeah, it's really the interesting. width of those roads built at that time, mm -hmm. East Market mm -hmm. and West Market. You very wide those roads. Those are very wide for a very for an old like town. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we have some had postcards. Some, they had foresight. We have some beautiful postcards in the collection. They're, they're up on the web on, on our website of, of East Market Street. They're very wide streets. Yes. How did you date it in the 50s? The, the cars look more like they're from the 30s and the 40s. The back of the postcard is dated, the message on the back oh, is dated 1952. Okay. So it's, it's 
probably from the 40s, but I don't the know. The photo is from the earlier. Yeah. It's not yeah. 52, you're yeah. right. Yeah. It's a little bit later. There's about that same time. And now, I love that sign. It says, New York this way, Berkshire's that way. There's <laughs> <laughs> a cigar store and a drug store, the Grand Union, Atlantic and Pacific. AMP, yeah. AMP, yeah. yeah. So you can see, and of course, these are all the new brick houses that were built after the, 18, the fire in 1867. AMP, after AMP, Stickle went in there with its five and dime store. This is a 1985. It looks now much like the current cigar mm -hmm. store. And the last slide is the current cigar store. Now, I don't know how long the billiard hall lasted, but sometime around the turn of the century, the shoe store came in there. And then in the cigar store, there's a sign that says, we started making our first cigars in 1929. Mm -hmm. That's what it says on the, on the poster in the store. Now, I spoke with Betty Cole, and she said her husband Don's Uncle Bill ran a cigar store in Soda Fountain that was there, and she moved to Rhinebeck in 1946. Mm. Now, Vern Sipoli told me that Bill Cole sold newspapers as well as cigars at the store, and in 1943, when Vern was in eighth grade, he and two other boys delivered the papers for $6 a week, minus six cents for Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> the, boy, the boys would get there at 5.30 on Sunday morning, drop the papers down a chute on around the corner, yeah. she says it's still there, and assemble the newspapers and deliver them to the customers. Yeah. And Burns, uh, Burns said he was happy because he always had some money. Peter didn't work and didn't have any money. <laughs> so he was always happy. He had a few dollars in his pocket. So thankfully this store continues to exist, a memory of Rhinebeck's past history with cigars, which has faded away. But um, that's the story of, of cigars in Rhinebeck. Wow. Well done.